wall. Praise the Lord, everybody, and welcome to Just Call Me Sarah. I am your host. I am Annie T. Broughton, and I am so thankful to be in your homes on this evening. We have an amazing topic that we want to talk to you about tonight, and it's Mothers Against Drunk Driving. So what I want you to do, please, ma'am, please, sir, is call someone and ask them to tune in to Just Call Me Sarah. I do have two amazing, young, powerful men of God that's going to be on the set with me tonight. Um, one of my guests tonight is Stephen Barrett. Um, he's the regional executive director of Mothers Against Drunk Driving, uh, South Carolina and North Carolina. And also we have Trevor Rubenser. <laughs> His 11 year old son, Ethan, was killed um, in a car crash by a drunk driver. But before I go to them, I do have a scripture that I wanna share for your hearing this evening. And it's lifted from Proverbs 20 and one. And it reads, wine is a mocker. Strong drink is a brawler. And whoever is led astray by it is not wise. Can I help somebody at home tonight to say that if you drink and drive, that is not a wise thing to do. So my topic tonight is mad against the devil <laughs> because we're wrestling not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. So hi, Stephen. How yeah. are you tonight? Very thank well. you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for being with me on Just Call Me Sarah and to share about this topic on mad mothers against drunk driving. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. Thanks for <laughs> having me today. Yes, and Trevor, thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you, thank you for having me. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. I, um, when I reached out to you, Stephen, I didn't, I didn't know that you had been on the Peggy Denny show before. <laughs> so I said, oh my God, and when you shared it with me, I said, wow, that's amazing. So you are doing a great work <laughs> in the kingdom and trying to get the word out. So you are the regional executive director. Yes. Tell us about you. Sure. Uh, well, I'm from the Greenville area in the upstate, um, from Greer, lived there, but I've been in the Columbia, Lexington area. I've been with MAD now for eight years, uh, basically overseeing South Carolina, and just recently got to start working with North Carolina as well. Uh, just proud as can be to be part of this organization, which since 1980 has been making an amazing impact on drunk driving, and we'll talk today about how bad the numbers are today, and, and they yeah. are disturbing. Uh, but on the other side, you know, it's less than half of the number of annual deaths than it was when we were formed 42 years ago. And MAD really has been really at the tip of the spear for a lot of those changes. So um, honored to be a part of that legacy, uh, to get to work with families like Trevor's family, um, to start the time again when we get those numbers to start going down again like they used to. Yeah, because I think I've read that South Carolina is the number one state for drunk driving. I mean, why, is, why do you think that's so? It's, uh, it's, it's hard to come up with an explanation on how that can be, although certainly our laws are weak. Um, yeah. And I think you can, you can make a very strong connection between that. But yeah, just to put some numbers with what you said. So in the last year we have number 2019, there were 285 people killed in our state in drunk driving. There's only nine states in the country that had more drunk driving deaths and we're 23rd in population. So wow. it's amazing to think that we have more drunk driving deaths in a state like Michigan that has 6 million more people than we do, or the state of New York, which is four times our population that we can have more drunk driving deaths. Um, it's something obviously that we stay motivated to work on because this state deserves mm -hmm. better and, and Every family that calls us having experienced a tragedy, we're honored to serve them, but we would love for the phone to stop ringing. Yes, exactly. And so, um, Trevor. Yes. Yeah, you went through an experience that I can't imagine any mother or father having to go through. But your 11-year-old 11, 11 son was killed due to a drunk driver. What happened? Well. And thank you for being with us uh, on Just Call Me Of course, and thank, thank you again for having me. Um, 
this happened just before his um, 12th birthday or what would have been his 12th birthday in um, 2019 and my wife was just taking him to school mm -hmm. right out in front of our subdivision there's a stop sign this is at about seven in the morning yeah so it's not when you expect this sort of thing to happen and um, she was making a left-hand turn on a green light, was the fourth car in the line. So there were mm -hmm. a number of cars that had gone through and an impaired driver came through from the other direction, ran the red light and collided with um, my wife's vehicle. Um, the, the vehicle was damaged very, very badly, and the point of impact was directly on the area where my son was sitting. And over the course of the next few hours, we found out that although they were get, able to get his heart started again, yeah. um, they did a CT scan and found out that um, it was a probable case of brain death. So over mm. the next couple of days, we sat in the hospital while they did the confirmatory tests. It's not like on the TV shows where they, you know, oh, we're going to pull the plug or something like yeah. that now. They do a variety of tests by different doctors some time apart. And so we found out that yes, indeed, he had suffered brain death. And at that point, our um, son became an organ donor, okay. which was kind of his last gift. He, he donated his, um, um, both of his kidneys, his heart, and his liver directly to um, people who were on the transplant list who needed them. So speaking out against impaired and drunk driving as well as in favor of organ donation is something that both of those things are very close to yeah. our heart. So Trevor, we know that you, your son mm -hmm. was 11. Yep. His name was Ethan. Yes. Yeah. Um, Tell us about that day. It happened so early in the day that um, it was kind of a bolt out of the blue. But I'll tell you, we were going that weekend to um, Wilderness of the Smokies because he loved the indoor water park that was there. So he was yeah. super excited about that. Um, the night before, that's all he could think about. He didn't really want to go to school that day, but my wife also worked at the school where he was, so he didn't really have an out um, to not go. And so that morning he came in like he always did. Um, I get to sleep or got to sleep later um, because of when I started work. So he came in and he gave me um, his kiss and told me he loved me and then he left and then maybe 10 or 12 minutes later, I get this call on the phone. And at first it was a number I didn't recognize. And you know how that works with cell phones and yeah. people trying to sell you things. So yeah. I just kind of ignored it and hung up. And then it rang again and I picked up and it happened to be somebody else who had witnessed the, um, the, the crash and had my phone number. So I jump in the car and drive up to the intersection, which was only a couple blocks away from where I was. Yeah. And um, the ambulance was just arriving from the scene and they had just started to pull Ethan from the car and immediately had to start Jesus. administering CPR at the side of the road because his heart had stopped. Oh my gosh. Um, my wife was kind of trapped in the car. Um, she was hurt as well, but not life-threatening um, injuries. And she was just, I mean, she was out of it, and she was just screaming about Ethan. Yeah. She didn't know where he was. He was Ethan was wearing his seatbelt, but um, the, the force of the crash was such that it actually jarred him out of it. So he was on the floor of the vehicle. Yeah. And um, she couldn't find where he was and she couldn't turn around because she was hurt so bad. I mean, she had broken ribs and um, a shoulder and a neck mm -hmm. um, injury. And so it was very chaotic. And then after that, it was kind of a blur until um, a few hours later, he had emergency surgery. Yeah. Um, and then a few hours later, 
They brought me upstairs. My wife was admitted, so she was in a separate room being scanned and everything mm -hmm. else to make sure there were no more internal injuries with her. And um, uh, three doctors came in to the room and they gave me a little pad of paper, said, if you wanna take notes on any of this, but then the first thing they said is, um, we don't expect your son to survive. And then I just, I mean, dropped the pen and that was it. I was able to understand what they were telling me. Essentially, yes. um, although you couldn't see it, it just looked like he was kind of asleep in the bed. They had done a CT scan after they re successfully restarted his heart at the hospital yeah. and found that um, his spinal cord was no longer connected to um, his brain. So, oh my God. Um, to put it in stark terms, um, he was internally decapitated. Oh my God. So we couldn't see that that had happened, yes. but that's what had happened. Mm -hmm. um, so over the next couple of days, they examined him. Um, they did tests to see if there was any oxygen that was getting to his brain in any way. They do tests to see Jesus. just lots of different types of tests, especially with um, with children, to confirm brain death. Yeah. And um, it's during Jesus. that time that I first met the folks from MAD um, who were there right away the minute they found out that this was an impaired driver. And um, the later on, the folks from um, Sharing Hope, South Carolina, those yeah. are the organ donation folks. Yeah. And um, they were with us through that entire process because, yeah. you know, we weren't thinking clearly. We did a lot of help. Not. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so even two years from now, every time I, I heard a siren on the way here, there was a, an ambulance coming through. And every time I hear a siren, I still hear it for like 10, 15 minutes after mm -hmm. um, the event, because on that day, there were just so many sirens. And so they, they kind of ring in your head almost. Yeah. So. so tell us about your... What kind of personality, what kind of child, what kind of kid was your son? Oh, Ethan <laughs> was, I don't know, precocious, you could say. He was. He wanted to hug everybody, he wanted to touch everybody. Um, he loved fishing, um, he loved to go to church, and he loved Sunday school. Um, he, Yeah, but he was a, a big hugger, a big um, uh, lover, um, somebody who was... I don't know, always wanted physical contact with people. Um, I don't know how he would have done during this whole pandemic <laughs> with the <laughs> restrictions on like touching and yeah. all, all of that sort of thing. Because he'd be, he, he was always all over people. He, um, touch was his love language. Yeah. And um, he was a very good kid and he, yeah. fortunately for us, Fortunately for Patty and I, my wife and I, yeah. um, his um, grandma was a living kidney donor. So my mom's still around. She donated a kidney um, years ago, before Ethan was even born, mm -hmm. um, to a family friend. And, um, well, actually to one of my aunts, but not somebody who was blood related to my mom. It just happened to be a match. And Ethan was enamored of that. And so he had always had the goal of being a living kidney donor. Mm -hmm. And he also said one day, this was in the car on almost the same route that my wife was driving on the day that he died. Um, he said, you know, if anything ever happens to me, um, I don't have a driver's license that I can put the heart thing on and everything, but I want to be, I want to be an organ donor. There's no reason not to be. Um, Ethan said it. Yeah, he did. He's, wow. I mean, he's probably 10, 9, <laughs> 10 years old at the time. Um, and honestly, that made, not, not that we wouldn't have done it anyway. Okay. Not that we wouldn't have done it anyway, but it made the decision so much easier and gave us so much more peace Yeah. with that process. Um, it was when I was in the hospital after they had already told me what happened to Ethan that um, I found out that um, the accident was caused by an impaired driver. 
Um, I mm. say impaired because uh, mad just doesn't just deal with like alcohol intoxicated drivers. Yeah. In this case, um, there was another drug that caused the impairment. And oh, so, okay. um, but thank you for bringing that yeah. point out. I mean, so yeah. the point is that yeah. just because a drug isn't legal doesn't mean that people aren't going to use it. So, the same type of precautions that people take and, um, you know, there or should take mm -hmm. when they decide to have a drink should be the same kind of precautions that people take if they, for, in for instance, decide to consume cannabis. You shouldn't, it's illegal, but people do. And when they do, the reaction time slows down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And those are the kinds of things that can cause crashes. So when I found out um, in the hospital, our family is kind of friends with uh, Sheriff Wright in Spartanburg. And um, so that, I mean, that was a shock. I, I didn't know at the time that I was in the hospital what had caused the accident. There are a fair number of accidents on Highway 9 in Boiling Springs. Okay. So yeah. you just, you, you, you don't know. It's kind of, it could have been anything. Right. And when I found that out, I was very, very angry after the initial couple of seconds of shock. Yes. And just realized that here it's 7 in the morning. You're just trying to go to school. Yes. Yes. It's, I mean, you, you don't think of these types of things to be the things that are going to happen at 7 a.m. Wow. Yes. So how are you and your wife, how are your family doing now? Well, hmm. I, I mean, psychologically, you never get over it. Okay. You don't. Um, the, I can look at like videos and stuff like that of Ethan. Mm -hmm. Patty can't. She's not at that point yet. Mm -hmm. But then there's things that she can do that I can't. Okay. Like she can watch a TV show and have a situation come up on the TV show that's similar to something that happened to Ethan and she can disassociate that and I can't. Mm -hmm. Um, so you never, you, you never get over it. Your coping mechanisms improve over time. Yeah. Um, our church community was, um, uh, very helpful in that regard and they've been very active um, with w whenever we participate in a in a mad walk like um, the one that's coming up in September um, they participate in large numbers they all pink was Ethan's favorite color so at like court hearings and stuff like that they would all they all bought and wore like pink t-shirts wow, with love beautiful. like Ethan on the sleeve and that was um, very very helpful helpful. So um, faith and church community, we wouldn't have been able to get through it at all. My wife still has physiological issues mm -hmm. from the accident. So she is going to have to ultimately, we had hoped to avoid this, but she's ultimately going to have to have um, uh, back surgery and have kind of a cage put around four of her mm -hmm. vertebrae. Um, and they go through through the front, so you get a big scar on oh, your neck. No. It's about 10 weeks of rehab after the fact. That's not just a product of the accident. There's, you know, genetic things involved there, too. But those things, those two things together um, have kind of put her in a bad spot. So she's kind of homebound now yeah. um, and will be because it's difficult to get back surgery during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. It's not life threatening, and so it's hard to get in to get that kind of surgery. So if people would also go ahead and um, you know take care of themselves in that way and take reasonable precautions to not end up in the hospital yes. um, and kind of clogging things up, then we can start those kinds of surgeries again, um, and that would be very helpful too. Well, the reason why I wanted you to share about your precious son, Ethan, because some of the times when we hear about these things happening, sometimes we become desensitized. Yes. Like, okay, that's just somebody else, whatever. And we don't think about the, the family, the pain, the hurt, mm -hmm. the devastation, the lifetime that they have to deal with this because somebody else maybe were impaired, like it's impaired. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, Stephen, talk to us about, and I want you to share 
what you feel like needs to be shared to, to, to awaken us <laughs> to mad and what does it mean and how can we can be more relevant, you know, and focused and helpful uh, to people say, whatever your reason is, don't get behind the wheel. Right. Well, you know, one of the things that should give us hope, it is 100% preventable. Um, I can't tell you t tomorrow how nobody can die from cancer or from yeah. heart disease or from COVID, but I can tell you how tomorrow not a single person can die from drunk or drug driving. And if that is, people would simply separate their decision to drive from their decision to take any alcohol or any or sort of other impairing drug. It's, it really is that easy and it's never been easier mm -hmm. to find a safe way home uh, with you know rideshare apps like Uber and Lyft that we have now, in addition to all the things we've always had. Um, you know, the police will get you home, the, the, the bartender will call someone and get you home, a friend will get you home. I, I think we, we seem most of the time to know how what a terrible decision this is, yeah. yet every day in our country there's an average of 300,000 drunk drivers on the road. I mean, it's, wow. it's, it's pretty frightening. The, you know, if the numbers don't change, every two out of three of us will be involved or impacted by a drunk driving crash sometime in our lifetime. So if people simply just made a plan before they go out to celebrate, uh, or anytime their plans involve alcohol, um, don't take a car in the first place. You know, Uber there and back, or whatever it might be. But um, yeah. if people wait to kind of decide how they're going to get home safely after they've had a few, they make they make impaired decisions rather than sober decisions, and those those yeah. consequences can be devastating. And, and as we always say, it's like you know a, a window that's been broken. You can never put it back together again. Mm -mm. Uh, you know, every I'm sure that the person who caused that crash would do any would do anything to turn back time and keep that from happening because their life is wow. obviously destroyed as well. But you cannot, you cannot unring the gong. It, 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 can't, it can't be done. Um, so people just have to make the good decisions up front because the consequences are so devastating. Yeah. I remember uh, when I, I used to pastor a church and I remember uh, one of my members, we had a, a conference at my church and she had just held my hand before she left church that night and she was telling me, I love you, Pastor Annie. You know, you're the best pastor. And on her way home that night, she was hit and killed mm -hmm. by a drunk driver. And her head was decapitated. And she stayed in the morgue for at least a day or two before we realized who she was. Because mm -hmm. when the police officer came and got her body from the car, they left her pocketbook there. Mm -hmm. And so they didn't know they had a Jane Doe tag on her toe. But I can understand how that was so devastating. That was devastating for me. I cried. I mean, I cried and I cried and I cried. So, Stephen, what, what are the main things that MAD does in South Carolina? Sure. So one of the, uh, we work to reduce crashes and, and when they end the crashes, at the same time we serve those who have been impacted. Um, we work on underage drinking issues. So, I mean, to talk about what we do to end crashes, um, one of the first things we do is we support our law enforcement officers because there's nothing that's going to more likely to protect us all from an impaired driver than having the most officers out there who are well trained and they have the equipment uh, and the passion to do DUI enforcement. It's not easy to do in South Carolina. So a, a large part of my job is going around all across the state thanking those law enforcement officers that are out there trying to get drunk drivers off the road showing you know when showing that they're out there so hopefully it deters other people from doing that mm -hmm. um, so they're a big part of of what we can do to reduce things is giving them all the support that we can wow. so that they can you know catch those um, and then of course we're always looking to change laws and policies um, in south carolina the main thing that we're trying to get done right now um, is uh, so some people have heard of what's called an ignition interlock device. It's basically like an in-car breathalyzer. Mm -hmm. And Mad's belief is that everyone convicted of drunk driving should have to have one of those on their car for some period of time, not for the rest of their life, maybe six months or a year on the first offense. Right. In South Carolina, we don't require that of everybody that gets convicted, only some. And the states that have required it of all convicted drunk drivers have had life-saving reductions. And certainly in a state like ours, which is so far behind, we really need to catch up to that. So we have a bill called Senate Bill 28 that made it some of the way through the legislature last year. Yes. It needs to go the rest of the way in 2022. Um, so that's the main thing that we're focused on the legislature. Of course, other things come up, but we really feel like if we can at least get that change, that will be a first step towards South Carolina, maybe starting to bring a little bit more sanity to these, to these numbers that we have. You have a link 
that you want to share tonight? Um, is it a link to the mat? Um, what did you hold me up? What, what was the sign? I'm going to look at that again. The uh, walk. Sure. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, the walks are a great time. If no one's ever been involved with MAD before, they don't know a lot about what we do. A Walk Like Mad event is a fantastic opportunity to come find out what we're about and find ways to get involved. So coming up very soon is Walk Like Mad Upstate. Uh, it'll be in downtown Spartanburg on September 25th. That's a Saturday morning. Uh, walklikemad.org slash upstate is the website. Uh, our walks are fundraisers, but they're also victim tribute events. And Ethan will be our honor victim. So we'll be kind of letting his story <laughs> awesome. serve uh, you know, as, as a inspiration and, and a, of why we need to work on everything that Mad's doing. Um, so we remember and honor our victims. We celebrate our first responders. We uh, celebrate the day that one day Mad is going to end drunk driving. We know, we know and believe that will happen one day, but we can't be patient to get there. Um, so that's perfect timing that not that, not that far from, from now that the event is coming up and it's a great way for people to come out and um, walk with our victims, thank our first responders, celebrate Mad's mission. Uh, it's, a really, it's a really great day that ties together everything that we do. Well, I am um, truly thankful and grateful uh, to you, Stephen and Trevor, for being with us today on Just Call Me Sarah. And I know it was just a short time, but you shared a great, you shared some valuable information that we needed to hear, that we needed to learn. So uh, we only got a couple of minutes left, but if one minute left, mm -hmm. <laughs> Can you just share something real real quick for us? Sure. Uh, just uh, letting folks know, you know, people who are involved with MAD, um, it's not just those who have been personally impacted. Obviously, a lot of our most powerful, impactful volunteers and speakers are people who have been, but all sorts of people can get involved in what we do. There's volunteer opportunities uh, during the daytime, occasionally on weekends, things you can do every week, things you can do one time a year. So anyone that wants to get involved or make this a charity that they support, uh, we're there. So our website is mad.org slash SC for South Carolina. Or for those who are on Facebook, that's where we kind of communicate the most about what we do. But we're always open to meeting new people who care about the cause and getting involved because only when we all get together to make a difference are we really going to finally get that number down to zero, which is what we're ultimately about. Awesome. We want to thank Stephen Barrett and Trevor Rubens for being with me on Just Call Me Sarah tonight. And we're praying that you have a wonderful evening in the Lord. God bless you. Have a great night.